losing your spouse, staying sober, and remaining with Christ. A story. It's Tammy's story. minutes after the hour that's matt baird from the band spoken singing restoring hope today on a monday restoring hope i'm j michael mccoy and if i haven't told you lately thanks for listening love this job couldn't do it without you got my cast of characters today army brad's in the house along with uh, we got to get you a nickname we haven't got you a nickname yet i just realized everybody has to have a nickname okay well i'll do, work on do it. do you have a nickname well my nickname is smack smack i know it's tough why? Well, my last name is Macaulay. Um, it was a Mac Smack thing. I played baseball, hit the ball pretty well. I'm a drummer, so it's a stupid name. We're it not going to call well, you Smack. Matt and uh, well Keith David is producing today, <laughs> and our special guest is Tammy Truitt uh, from the great land of Atlantic Iowa, where you can only drink Coca Cola. It's true. I, I've heard that. Uh, and Tammy's got a wonderful story that she's going to share with us uh, today. And uh, uh, we like to have people come in and tell their stories. It's my personal belief that testimony is our DNA connection with God. It is the one thing that is unique to us. We all, scare, we all share the same scripture. We all share the same disciples. We all share the same Jesus. But the story of how the hound of heaven caught us and brought us to the knees of Jesus is uniquely ours. And when someone shares their story, it impacts someone else. Somewhere in the middle of Tammy's story is something that maybe you need to hear. Maybe something God wants you to hear. And the only way you're going to hear it is by listening to this show on this day to my guest, Tammy. So we invite you to listen today, and we thank you for being here. Uh, uh, let's get a little background. You're born and raised in... I was born in born in Omaha, moved to Exira, Iowa at Exira. the age of two. Yes, booming Danish metropolis of Exira, Iowa. What What did your parents do that you moved to Exira? My mom married a farmer. Okay, and uh, so you and grew I up on a with farm. The package, yeah. yeah, yeah. I grew up on a farm. Farm girl, oldest of five. Wow. Okay, and so you graduated from high school, Xavier High. Exira High. Exira, excuse me. Xavier would be very awesome to have a, but no, Exira High, yeah, graduated and could not get out of town fast enough. I bet. Um, moved to this booming metropolis of Des Moines, Iowa, and uh, worked in retail and sang in bar bands and had a great time. And you had quite a drinking career. I did, short, but, but very much uh, intense. Started at age what? 13. Wow. Yeah. And went to what? 21. Got sober uh, November 13th, 1982. Isn't that, isn't that amazing how everybody remembers their date? Yeah. Uh, so what happened on, what did you say it was, November? November the 13th, 1982. Yeah, what happened that day that caused you to well, decide there was you were going to get married? Well, really cute guy that I was seeing who had been um, out of treatment for about a year. And he told me that I was screwing up his sobriety mm. and I thought he was really awesome. So I told him I would quit drinking and that seemed like a really good idea at when I had a hangover in the morning, but it was not sounding really great that later that day, but he took me to my first meeting, uh, a recovery meeting uh, a couple days later and, uh, I wound up marrying him. Wow. Yep. So you've been married, you've been sober 30 years. Yes. It'll be 31 years this year. Yep. Man, that see for guys like me that are at you know one thousand and twenty four days, mm -hmm. that just seems like an awful long time. It's Thirty a, years it's to a never. Lifetime, yeah, but it it happened one day at a time. Were, what was it? Your youthful flings, or were you an alcoholic? No, I I I truly I think I was I can say that I was I am an alcoholic. I drank like an alcoholic from the day I first took a sip of alcohol. Yeah, that's what they say. You one of the measures of a true alcoholic is the moment they take their first sip. That's it. It changes. I wanted to get there. And yeah. I knew what got me there, and it was Bud Light, and that's that's what I knew. And I, I there you know there, I'm I'm sure there's lots of different things that go into that, but I 
I can just, I knew, and I was, I could probably tell you that I was an alcoholic before I started drinking. Sure. Just the personalities and such, but. And you were the cool chick who played guitar in the band? You know, I wasn't a cool chick in high school. I was a loud chick in high school. Okay. I was a speech person. I had, uh, I did drama, speech, and musicals, and all that sort of stuff. Um, found out that uh, I could kind of pick on the guitar and I could sing a pretty loud Linda Ronstadt song. So, uh -huh. they, you know, and I was dating a guy who played a guitar and they put me in front of a microphone and we just started playing around here. What was the name of your first band? Uh, you remember? First band was called Runner. Runner? Yep. And you played here in Des Moines? Yep. Played at Joe's 2 over on the east side. Okay. Right over there yep. a little bit. I don't yeah. know that. Played a, <laughs> played a few bars. I played the, the PJ Brennan's up on uh, Merle Hay Road back then, back in the day. Okay. And you said you worked retail. Yep. Where'd you work? Tober's for fashion. Sure. No longer here anymore. I remember. At Merle Hay Mart Mall. Yep. I remember. All right. And, uh, uh, and you work in Omaha. Yes, I do. So are you a Hawkeye fan or a Nebraska fan? I am a Hawkeye fan. <gasps> Yay. <laughs> I wear my Hawkeye t-shirt underneath my University of Nebraska, because I work for the University College of Dentistry. Right. So, yeah. You got you to gotta be a big red fan outside. Yeah, well, I, 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 I'm, I'm mute on but, the subject. So, so you're secretively a Hawkeye fan. Yeah. Now, don't you work. know that our secrets make us sick? Oh, that, that secret keeps me sane. Oh, <laughs> there are some secrets that, that make you whole. Yeah, how, how, how about those, uh, that basketball game the other night? That was good, wasn't it? Yeah. 60 I, to 64, I, I think. Nebraska won. Yeah, they did. And that, that football game, not, never mind, I'm being see, arrogant. This, it is your yeah, show. See, this is the I, trouble with the, uh, the Nebraska fans. So. We're, we're pompous and arrogant. Yeah. We know it. <laughs> I, I know. I was, I was born and raised there. But see, I moved to Des Moines in 78, and I hear all about this Hawkeye stuff. And so I go to the library, and I look, look up national championships, and there are none. And I look up big, big 10 champions, and there aren't very many. And when you come from where I come from, That's, yeah. you're rated on how many national championships you compete for and win. Right. Well. Okay. Well. Well, you, then you weren't looking at anything with wrestling because... No, I didn't. You no, if you're from Nebraska, you're only into football. And because we beat Iowa, now, now I know a little bit about our basketball team. I'm pompous and arrogant, dude. I mean, that's just the way it is. All right, anyway. Um, so November 13th, 1982, you get sober and you're 21. So right. you're, legally, you can now drink. Yeah. But I, you stop. I did. Yeah, I did. But, but you did it for a boy. Mm -hmm. I, well, yeah, that's, what I'll, that's what I thought at the time. But you figured out later on that it was something you needed to do for yourself? Well, you know, after a while, it, it starts to kind of sink in. And, it, and I hung around with a lot of people who were trying to get well, too. And okay. that helped a lot. And I heard my story a lot coming back at me from other people. Yeah. And I knew I was in the right place. Yeah. And life was just a lot easier without drinking. It's so fun to sit in those rooms because you've, you've, you've got these things, especially when you knew. You've got these things that you know you've done. And you're never going to speak of them. You hear about the fourth step and you go, well, that one won't be on there. And then all of a sudden, somebody in the middle of a room of 60 people say, oh, I remember when I blank, blank, blank. And you just you fall off your chair because you Absolutely. can't believe not only did somebody else do that, but they just said it out loud in exactly. a room with 80 other people. And usually laugh about it. Yeah. Yeah. That stuff was tragic when I first got sober. They're laughing about things that I did not find the least bit of humor in no. any of it because no. I was neck deep in it. That's right. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a wonderful organization for those of you who uh, uh, who sit there and and wonder if you could ever live your life without alcohol uh, and drugs. You can. Now, for me, I know for you, and I know for you, it was by the grace of God, and it wasn't the God of our understanding. It started out to be that way, but it was the God called Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. But there are many people who sit in those rooms who have no faith in a power greater than themselves in the room, in the 12 steps, and they are spectacular people for it. How, so. how successful are the people without faith, or do they end up coming to faith to be successful? Um, well, we got two other people that will give you an opinion there. I would tell you that there are that to get sober and to go through the 12 steps, you will have a spiritual experience, maybe a couple of them. The question is whether you have a spiritual awakening. And I think those people without faith don't ever have that. 
They somehow realize that there is something greater than themselves, and that's what keeps them sober. Maybe they call it God. Maybe they just call it whatever. What would you say to that, Tammy? It's been my experience that the people who are happy, joyous, and free mm -hmm. have come to a belief in God. A Christian Jesus. God? Yeah. I, okay. at, for, at least at least an acceptance of it's other than a doorknob or a horse. Right. Um, I, um, the people who don't go back out. Um, for research. For more research or more bullets in the butt or whatever you want to call yeah. it. Yeah. Um, the 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 biggest struggle I think they have is with with the power greater than themselves. I think that's the spiritual aspect of the program does not get down on the inside and 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 take hold and have the awakening as you were talking about. Yeah, that's yeah. my experience in the time I've been around. But it doesn't smack <laughs> Mac. <laughs> <laughs> it, but it doesn't exclude you from from being sober. It's just no. I, I no. Tammy was dead on. I mean, it, it's the level of sobriety that you experience, you know, and but I, I don't think that yeah, it's a non-denominational type thing. It's not a Catholic uh, God or a, a Baptist God or right. or this and that. But um, um, and you find the people that are. Oh, you know, still struggling with control things and, and just trying to constantly put a round peg in a square hole. It's like when I'm out of God's will, I know I'm trying to control something that I have no control over. Right. And um, I don't know. It's sobriety is a good thing in my world. Well, but it's interesting you say that because even though we all, I mean, the four of us would say, the five of us would say we all praise the same God. Um, we do have that unique relationship with him that is our own like i said earlier with our testimonies we also have that dna in in, in that relationship because I, I totally related to what you just said i know that i am i am struggle or i know i'm swaying away from god when i'm trying to control something and i don't mean control in a negative way i just mean not surrendering it to god's will mm -hmm. and there's nothing worse that'll mess up god's will than our will trying to slap over it so uh, Tammy Truitt is our guest today. We've been hearing her story. She was 13 and a rebel rouser in Exyria, Exyra, Exyra, Nebra, <laughs> Iowa, and uh, played in a rock and roll band called Runners. Is that right? Runner. Runner. Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, you played with some guys that are kind of known around here. They were at the time. Yeah. Well, the one guy you mentioned is still around. The first guy. Last name started with a C, I think. John Cortez, he's actually out in Connecticut, right? Now. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah okay. but he played here Chaffee. for a while. Rod Chafee played here, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I didn't play with him, but he was playing about the same yeah. time we were. Um, Mike Shakatano was a he's a great guitar player, played around back in those days, back in the 80s. So, yeah, yeah. and that's your line of passion, too. Yep. Smack. <laughs> you you sneer when you say that. Well, I can't. I just can't. I can't. Just let it roll, Mac. It'll I just be okay. can't call somebody smack. Okay. Well, we'll work. I feel on. like we're a bunch of bikers sitting outside the state fair, East End Tap. Nothing wrong with that either. So. <laughs> Except for maybe sitting outside the East, East End, End tap. tap. All right. Um, all right. So uh, we're going to take our first break, and when we come back, we're going to uh, find out a little bit about how Tammy's life went and. And uh, she married her, uh, wasn't a high school sweetheart. It would have been after high school. Yep. Not and too much, but a little bit. He brought her to sobriety, and then tragically, she lost him. And how did that work with her sobriety? How did that work with her relationship with God? Uh, were there events of yelling at God and being mad at God and walking away from him? Uh, we'll talk about those things when we come back. Tammy Truitt is our guest, Army Brad in the house in Smack, and along with uh, King David uh, producing today as Dan has the day off. I'm J. Michael McCoy. We're coming back live here on 99.3 KTIA, powered by webcast1live.com. Let's listen to a little bit of the song Restoring Hope by Matt Baird.
from the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios. This is Webcast One Live. If you choose to obey the power of sin, it leads to death. If you choose to obey obedience, it leads to righteousness. Forgiveness is just the beginning of life in Christ. God wants us to live for him now. And because of Jesus Christ, the gospel was preached. And you and I are blessed today because of Abraham. Did you know that? We're blessed. Experience Truth, 99.3 FM. Drug and alcohol addiction slowly steals a person's identity, tearing away pieces of their life little by little until one day it seems like the hope of a happy future is gone and there's no chance of getting it back. Here at St. Gregory Retreat Centers, we can assure you that there is hope. Our unique approach to recovery begins with the understanding that the dysfunction and damage caused by addiction can be overcome, not just dealt with. Don't let another day go by. Call St. Gregory today. Fight the good fight on a Rebels Cause Radio. Thursday evenings at 8 p.m. Central Standard Time on a Rebels Cause.com. A Rebels Cause Radio is edification. Whether you're 10, 25, 50, 80 years old and beyond, everyone needs to live within their means. I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America. For almost a quarter of a century, we've helped people of all ages learn to manage their personal finances to benefit them far into the future. When problems arise, we've got the experience you need to make those debt problems go away. Got financial problems? Call Consumer Credit of America. The only way we come to know the saviorship of Jesus Christ is by bowing and acknowledging that he is Lord and King over all the earth. Jesus Christ died on a cross, paid the penalty for our sin, and by repenting of our sin and accepting him by faith, what he did for us, we are forgiven. Salvation is not a combination of faith and works. Salvation is by faith alone in God. Experience Truth, 99.3 FM. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Twenty-one minutes after the hour on this Restoring Hope Magic Monday. Tammy Truitt is my guest, along with Army Brad and uh, King David producing. Uh, Father Tattoo has the day off today. And Dennis, the Red Hot Rider. I just got to come up with a name for you. I, I can't we'll call you Smack. The I Menace. Just, what? Dennis, Dennis the, the Menace? menace. Oh. The menacing one. Dennis the Menace. <laughs> I like that. It's a rather... 50s and cliches, but I've been called worse, my friend. <laughs> well, I, I, you have to like your nickname. That's the rule. Okay. Yeah, you, you don't like your nickname, then we don't call you that. All right. Uh, Tammy Truitt is in the house. Tammy and I, this is one of these neat relationships that started on Facebook. And I don't know how I friended you or you friended me. Who knows back then? But we knew we had some things in common. I think you reached out to me when I hit a, uh, maybe a year or something. I think you, I think you said something to me. Yeah, I think uh, we have a mutual friend, Mitch Matthews. Oh, sure. Um, okay. I, I've done uh, I've done a couple of dream, big dream gatherings. Yeah. Uh, those were life altering moments for me. But um, I think that was there's a bit of a connection there. And I, I think you did mention something about a, a sobriety milestone. And I think I just said, way to go. Yeah. Keep trudging. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Tammy's been sober. It'll be 31 years this November. And you look at her and say, well, what? She started drinking at seven. Close. Thirteen. And was the terror of the farm? 
yeah, I was not <clears throat> I was not an easy child to raise, not at all. But thankfully, my parents were patient, and they had four others at home, so they knew they couldn't expend all the energy on me. So, right. Yeah. Were you youngest, oldest in the middle? Oldest. Oldest. So did you start any other of your uh, brothers or sisters drinking? I don't think so. No? No. No, they're pretty normal. Yeah, the normies. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> All right. So uh, you get married to this wonderful guy. What's his name? Mitch. Mitch. Mm -hmm. And you live in Atlantic, Iowa. Yeah. Right? Just and you work in, have you always worked in Omaha? No, no, I, I've, I've had a very diverse and varied career path. Uh, when, I, when, we, uh, when we got married, I was actually working for the newspaper in Atlantic, and shortly thereafter started working for the Area Education Agency and got a job working in special education um, as a paraprofessional. I thought I'd do that the rest of my life, and we just started, you know, my husband was an attorney, and we were paying off massive student loans and yeah. trying to buy a house, living the dream, and you know, had a couple of kids and just, it, you know, it wasn't all, it wasn't all, uh, it wasn't all unicorns and rainbows, but it, it was looking in from the outside. One would, one would say it was a pretty leave it to beaver life, I think. Yeah. And then something changed your life. Yeah. Well, even before, um, before Mitch was killed, um, we 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 kind of we had just come out of a really stormy uh, season in our marriage, and it was uh, we were we were probably it, it was a actual I'm, it had to be divine intervention that we were not divorced. We just didn't want to divorce on the same day. I think is what happened. Wow. Yeah. And uh, so we just kind of come out of that. And um, what brought you out of it? You know, was it a I, microwave or was it a crock pot? It, well, it's it felt like a crockpot because it seemed like a long time to me. Um, you know, we we had a fairly dysfunctional marriage probably from the very beginning. We just didn't know it. Um, two sure. recovering people who uh, weren't very good at you know being honest and open and and willing. And so, um, but I I think we did we did as good as we could for with the tools that we had at the time. And it just it came it just came to a head um, in about two thousand and four. Um, and we, uh, we were about ready to throw it in. I, I don't know what changed in him. I, I, you know, I would like to think that I think, I think he had another spiritual awakening. He started going back to meetings. He got a sponsor, mm. um, wow. mm. got a sponsor that told him to eat breakfast and make his bed every day. Yeah. Um, little things leading to big things. And, um, he started changing and I, before that, just, I had just decided to, throw myself into seeking God's will for my life. And if that was to, if that was to move out on my own and take my kids, then I would do that. But I, I didn't, I never felt released to do that. Um, yeah, I've always, Spirit. I've always, and, and I, and I don't say this, um, um, judgmental. I've always wondered how, um, someone who's seeking God's will could come up with the fact that it was to break their family up. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I just couldn't, yeah, couldn't come there to that. I, you know, I probably could have and, we, and left to my own devices would have um, just really started getting into the word more. And um, that'll change you. That'll, yeah. that'll make your life turn upside down. Yeah. And um, that's kind of what happened. And I prayed for the strength to leave a couple of times and God gave me the strength to stay mm. and things changed. We got we got better and we things turned around and in the August of 2005 was our 15th wedding anniversary we went down to the hotel where we spent our honeymoon in Mexico and we renewed our wedding vows oh and, cool um, we just decided from that point on that we were going to do things God do things God's way and not our way and it had really gotten good it had gotten really good um, and so, you know, I look back on those times of, uh, of the marriage going bad or what seemed to be bad. And, uh, it's amazing that, you know, it was a little over a year later that he was killed in an accident and the, all the Bible verses that I had posted on my refrigerator were what I was looking at when I got that news. And I figured out why those Bible verses were on my refrigerator that, that night. And, um, so it, 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 
you just can't really it my whole life did stop you know you mentioned about screaming at god i i didn't really seem very fair that we had you know dug this dug this marriage out of the sewer and a little more than a year later we were at, he wasn't with me anymore and that didn't you know the the Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you, says mm-hmm. the Lord plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans for a hopeful future. And it just did not seem like a hopeful future. And um, it was, I, but I, the, but in the deep down inside of me, the part that God knows and the only God knows, there was, there was a little beam of hope that we weren't going to, we weren't going to flounder forever. And um, we have two children. They, my son was um, three weeks shy of being 14 when mm. his dad was killed, and my daughter was 11. Mm. And, you know, that's, uh, that's, that was the hard part. Yeah, because you couldn't part. fall apart. No, no. Yeah. Because the last thing they needed was, you know, a crazy mom in the bedroom who wouldn't get out of bed. Yeah. Tammy Truitt is our guest today. Uh, I put something on Facebook. I, uh, and I, one of the subjects was somebody who had lost a love and uh, not because of old age. And, and how did you handle that? Little did I know Tammy would step up and, and then you add sobriety into that. Did that ever become a question after Mitch was killed? You know, no. I mean, I, I had a lot of friends in recovery who came and were worried about, you know, I said, this isn't the stuff that makes you drink. This, this big stuff doesn't make you drink. It's the, it's the little tiny stuff that adds up. The guy cutting you off in traffic, you know, not talking to your spouse, kids acting up, things not going your way yeah. on a daily basis. I, I, that's at least that's my opinion. Um, what it did, what sobriety did for me is it helped me to handle grief one day at a time. Mm-hmm. I didn't, if I thought about the future, um, I got real scared and overwhelmed really fast because I had no clue how I was going to support two children um, and 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 raise them. And were you were you um, at any point surprised at your financial settings? Um, do you know what I'm saying? Oh it, yeah. I mean, I, I you, you see it in movies where a spouse gets killed and and there's nothing. And there was nothing. And we, um, I had great, um, I had great family support and, and God does, you know, there, he will supply all of your needs. And I, uh, that, um, that definitely played completely out in my life. Um, kindness of strangers, perfect strangers, um, helping us out financially until I could get on my feet and get a full-time job with benefits. Um, I was, I'm a dental hygienist now. My husband insisted that I go to school and get a bachelor's degree. Um, I thought I, I, I was like, okay, it it was great. I enjoyed learning. I enjoyed the process. It was, it was very, uh, very life altering for me, but you know, little did I know that that education, that degree, uh, was what was going to support my family later. Now, you, you would think that an attorney um, would have been able to leave something behind or prepare something. Yeah, you'd think. But he didn't. Not so much. When my, when my, when my, dad's, dad, when my dad's dad died, when my grandfather died, uh, we were very entrepreneurish, owned a lot of businesses, and everybody just thought there'd be something there. He didn't believe in life insurance. He didn't have a dollar. people live you know, kind of by a shoestring a lot of times too. Yeah. So, and, and, we, and, that, and we were self-employed and I worked part-time. I was a part-time mom and I was a full-time mom and a part-time employee employer. So it was, it, and you know, it, it neither here nor there, I guess at this point, but it, it people are, are, are amazing. Now your son's name is my son's name is chance. And what was the hardest thing do you think for chance at the time? Everything. It just it hit just, him hard. Yeah, it really hit him hard. Um, you know, um, my experience with raising my son was up until about the age of eleven or twelve. He was my, you know, he was mommy's boy. Yeah. And all of a sudden, dad's world got really interesting. Uh, the hunting, the driving, all of those things. You know that that are you know a tad more masculine, um, and that transition from mommy's boy to a young man into his dad's world was just beginning. 
and you know, I could, it was beautiful. It was beautiful to watch, beautiful to see my husband step up into that role. And, um, and it, you know, it just, that, that, that moment in time, you know, and not that it would ever be a good moment to lose your dad. Um, but it was just, it was devastating. It was not a good time. Not a good time. And your daughter? My daughter is a little more quiet about it, but she's, it's it's changed her. She's very serious. She's um, she's the polar opposite of my son. She's my overachiever. My okay. um, how long has Mitch been gone? Just a bit over six years. A bit over six mm-hmm. years. Tammy Truitt is our guest. Um, she's just telling her story, sharing her testimony. You know how I feel about testimony. It's the DNA that God ties Himself to us with. And there's something inside of Tammy's story that you're supposed to hear, or maybe your neighbor's supposed to hear, or maybe it is you. And have you heard it yet? Well, we're going to continue with this story and talk about that moment she found out that her husband had been killed in an accident and how her relationship with Christ changed and how her relationship with her children changed and how her life just seemed to unfold as she had to stay and be a mom and take care of her kids because that's what she was there to do. We'll continue this conversation when we come back live here on The Truth, 99.3 KTIA, powered by webcast1live.com. Remax Real Estate Concept Studios. This is Webcast One Live. Drug and alcohol addiction slowly steals a person's identity, tearing away pieces of their life little by little until one day it seems like the hope of a happy future is gone and there's no chance of getting it back. Here at St. Gregory Retreat Centers, we can assure you that there is hope. Our unique approach to recovery begins with the understanding that the dysfunction and damage caused by addiction can be overcome not just dealt with. Don't let another day go by. Call St. Gregory today. I'm Rob Spearman. I'm a broker owner of Remax Real Estate Concepts in Des Moines, Iowa. Give us a call if you're looking at buying or selling a home, or if you're having trouble on your mortgage payments or looking to purchase foreclosures, we have the agents to help you. Experienced, outstanding agents. Our office number is 515-276-2872. Or if you'd like to look at homes, go to our website, homeconnectusa.com. Whether you're 10, 25, 50, 80 years old and beyond, everyone needs to live within their means. I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America. For almost a quarter of a century, we've helped people of all ages learn to manage their personal finances to benefit them far into the future. When problems arise, we've got the experience you need to make those debt problems go away. Got financial problems? Call Consumer Credit of America. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live.
22 before the top, Salem Radio Network News, and then, oh yeah, True Blue with Pastor Michael Mudloff from Westkirk Presbyterian Church. Uh, Tom Clegg in tomorrow. You know Tom, you love Tom. We're talking about the five powerful spiritual characteristics of a church. A healthy church, if they're followed. A dying church, if they're not. And uh, we'll be on number three tomorrow which is, um, let me think, number three is relationships. So how does a church, which remember, a church is not a building. A church is a body of Christ. It's you and me. How do we build, care for, and protect those relationships? Because inside of a church, so many times, the thing that causes the most amount of pain is when we don't protect those relationships, when we cut them in half and we bark off at them and we uh, I, I always say people who don't have power at work uh, wield power at church and a lot of times you'll find men and women who have unfortunately found themselves in jobs they don't enjoy in careers they don't want to have working nine to five in something they don't want to do and when they get to church that's where they want their responsibility and their respect and a lot of times that tears churches in half so Tom Clegg will be here tomorrow and we'll talk about that um, Army Brad in the house, along with King David producing, uh, Father Tattoo having the day off. Uh, Smack is here, Dennis, and uh, Tammy Truitt is our guest. And Tammy's been telling us a little bit of her story. She uh, raised in a small town, farm town girl in Iowa on November 13th of 1982. She decided at age 21 she had have a, had, had a long enough drinking career. And she quit drinking at 21, uh, married a guy who was almost her high school sweetheart and had two babies and was living pretty good life. Yeah. Pretty good it life. Was... Been through some tough stuff, but, you know, everybody does. That's right. That's right. And then what time and what day did you get that call? 10 o'clock, November the 13th. A.M.? Uh, no, it was in the evening. November 13th? Yeah. Same day as your sobriety? My sobriety birthday. Wow. What year? Oh 204? 2006. 2006. 10 o'clock at night, you get a phone call. Who was the phone? Actually, it wasn't a phone call. It was his parents showed up and uh, to my house. They had heard, and they were, they were notified first. Um, okay. And they came down and told us. And did they live in? Yep, they lived just right up the street. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they didn't call first? No. They so thought they'd better come. You're at home, mm -hmm. and doorbell rings, or do they just walk in? They just in? came in, yeah. And you must have thought that was strange at 10 o'clock at night. I did, because I thought it was him. I okay. thought he was coming home. All right. Yeah. And you looked up, and it was mom and dad. Yeah. And what'd was. they say? They said there had been an accident, and it didn't look good. Okay. And we waited most of the evening into the wee hours of the morning. Lots of people. We have an amazing town uh, we've you know my husband grew up there um, his parents had been in business there their whole lives and um, and so we what a wonderful you know knitting of of people that we had around us and they came running and they were in my house and and waiting with us as we made listen to phone calls and we got the we got the final um, the final verification of what we thought to be true early on at, in, at about three o'clock in the morning. Okay. Yeah. And, and I appreciate you sharing this. I don't ever want to be in that moment, but for those people that one day find themselves in that moment, share how you felt, share, share the emotions. Man, there, you know, you'd think you'd be screaming and yelling because I, you know, I kind of, I'm, I'm kind of a drama queen. So I, I kind of, you know, I, I've pictured my own funeral from time to time and lots of other dramatic things in my life. But it, I was, it was just, it, there was, I was void of, of emotion. It was, it was an, an emptiness that I, I could never explain to you probably or, or wish on anyone, but it was a definite 
giant hole through my gut is what it felt like. And that I, I knew, though, that things weren't ever going to be the same. So were you empty? Were you mad? Were you sad? Were you angry? Yes. All of the above. Yeah, but not on the surface. It, you know, I, I, I think I had a very, I felt very controlled at the time. Okay. Um, part of that, I think, was for my children. Were they up at three by then? They were up and yeah, well, they were up at ten. Okay. When when we got the news and and yeah, they were they stayed up with us. And, okay. And uh, uh, out of all of those people that you were surrounded by at that time, uh, did anybody lose it? You know, not hysterically so. Okay. You know, there, we I mean we cried we we had our moments, but there was there was a there was a otherworldly calm in the room. And was that the Holy Spirit? Uh, well, my mother is a rabid Christian lady. Okay. She just spent hours on her knees for me and every one of her kids. And she was with us and we prayed and um, a lot that night. Um, but there, it, I, it, it, it had, it, I believe with my heart that it was the Holy Spirit just keeping keeping the peace, keeping the peace that night with us. You said that your refrigerator was covered with Bible verses. Yeah. Can you recall one or two particular ones? Be anxious for nothing, but in everything through prayer and petition, make your, make your requests known to God and the peace that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Philippians that's the first, 4, 6. That's the first one I saw. Okay. That I remember looking at. So, you 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 killed it, baby. That's yeah. one of my life verses. Is it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Be anxious for nothing, though. It seemed like a real oxymoron at the time. Did um um, in comparison to you, how did your mother-in-law handle it? Because she had just lost her son. Yeah, she was, she was very, very sad. Uh, in a, in a all not, believers. Uh, yeah. It, it, different degrees, sure. different different uh, levels of their walk, I okay. would say. Um, but, um, you know, it, and she had lost a son, and so that's different than losing a husband and different than losing a brother or a dad. And, you know, there's one thing I've learned in this journey is that no grief is really worse than another. It's just different. And the only thing I know is the gr grief that I have, that I've had to walk out. You know, I, I can't even relate to my children because both of my parents are still living. Yeah, sure. And so, um, you know, she, they're, they are, they're very private people and, and they, um, but you know, we, they were amazing to me and helped me in, in ways that I can never repay to, to walk through that. Tammy Truitt is our guest. We're talking about her life story on November 13th of 2006. She found out her husband had been killed in a tragic accident and how she handled it. She had been, uh, at that time, 25 years sober, 24 Almost. years sober. And, uh, but you said that was never in question. How about your relationship with God? Where did that go? Do we, if, if we could roll the cameras that were unseen, were you yelling at God in your bedroom when no one else was around to hear it? Yeah, I was. I, I, was, I was ticked off. I was really ticked off. And I... Um, But yet I knew that I still needed to pray. I, I knew that even though I was mad at him, he would be my source. And so it's kind of like your spouse. Yeah. You know, I can be mad at you and still love you. Right. Uh, I can be mad at you and still need you. Um, so that's kind of the, I just decided to just be honest with him from day one. And I don't think he was one bit surprised since he's the guy who made me in the first place. Right. I, um, my personal, I'm sure he wasn't, um, uh, just shaking his head saying, I can't believe she'd behave this way because he I made you, he made me and he knew, he knew how I would behave. Um, but all the, the preparation to save or the, up until that time to save my marriage or what I thought was to save my marriage, all that stuff was already on the inside of me in a, in a, in a, on reserve. So that was uh, a great, when I was too tired, I could, I could go to that well. So God saved their marriage and then took her husband. What's the moral of the story for us all to learn? We'll talk about that when we come back live here on webcast one live.
www.thepeopleshow.com. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Drug and alcohol addiction slowly steals a person's identity, tearing away pieces of their life little by little until one day it seems like the hope of a happy future is gone and there's no chance of getting it back. Here at St. Gregory Retreat Centers, we can assure you that there is hope. Our unique approach to recovery begins with the understanding that the dysfunction and damage caused by addiction can be overcome, not just dealt with. Don't let another day go by. Call St. Gregory today. If you choose to obey the power of sin, it leads to death. If you choose to obey obedience, it leads to righteousness. Forgiveness is just the beginning of life in Christ. God wants us to live for him now. And because of Jesus Christ, the gospel was preached, and you and I are blessed today because of Abraham. Did you know that? We're blessed. Experience Truth, 99.3 FM. If Tom Coates from Consumer Credit of America was your personal webmaster, Tom would filter out all bad debt emails. If Tom was your mailman, you'd never get any debt reduction junk mail. If Tom Coates was a lineman, he'd block any phone calls offering to reduce your credit card debt. Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America, and we're still your best choice for credit counseling. We're local, we're accountable, and we can do more. You make the call when the time's right for you. When it comes to competition, there really is none for Consumer Credit of America. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Ten minutes before the top, Salem Radio Network News, and then Pastor Michael Mudloff with True Blue from West Kirk Presbyterian Church. We're live here with Tammy Truitt, uh, getting uh, her story out there, because uh, her story, her testimony is something that one of us needed to hear. I know I did. I know I've learned from it. Have you learned from it? You know, we always love to have feedback from you. You can email us. You can Facebook us. There's a hundred ways to get a hold of us. But we'd always like to hear how these programs impact you. And remember, just like when I was in the restaurant business, I like it when people tell me they like my cheeseburgers, but I need you to tell me when you don't. If you didn't like this program or any other program we ever do, I want to know about it. Uh, I'll put on my big bear pants, big boy pants, and I'll handle it well, I promise. All right, Tammy. Um... Uh, November 13th, 2006, your husband's killed in a tragic accident. You've, you've already got a relationship with Christ. You, you, had, you and your husband had gone through some tough times and had restored that marriage. What did God tell you was the reason that your husband was gone? He didn't tell me. I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know why. I don't think I get to know why. And that's... I'm okay with that now. I wasn't early on. I okay. wanted to know why because I, I thought like I had paid my dues. Um, I'm probably not too unlike a lot of Christians who think, you know, privately that maybe being a Christian is going to get me a get out of jail free card on some of the pain and suffering. Um, but I have learned that that's not the case. Um, uh, Jesus said uh, in this life, you will have trouble. Um, but be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. And that's, that's been, I don't know why he's gone. I have no, I have no clue as to really why he's gone. Did God ever just whisper in your ear, Hey, it's not about you. It was time for him to come home. It wasn't about him. It was, it was when he hit me between the eyes and said, your husband's death isn't all about you. Okay. And that was, um, a good and a bad day altogether. I'll bet. Yeah. It was cause it's not, it's not all about me. Um, I have learned that, um, you know, his death has impacted many, many people. And, but it, it, it's not that a defining moment in 
it doesn't have to be the defining moment, I guess I should say. Well, and, and life didn't get any easier because you then suffered from two cancers. Right. Um, in the, in the uh, summer of 2008, I was diagnosed with melanoma, two surgeries, uh, skin graft, uh, laid up for quite a while getting that taken care of. Um, in that process, they found out that I had a tumor on my thyroid, so they, that, which turned out to be benign, which was great. Um, and then in March of 2009, I was diagnosed with breast cancer mm. and had uh, several surgeries uh, to take care of that and reconstruction. No treatment, thank God, but um, right. that wasn't easy on my kids either. I'll they, bet. I think they thought they were going to be orphans. You're going to lose both their parents. Yeah, they did. Did that strengthen their faith? It did my daughter's. Okay. Uh, my daughter is a, is a, an amazing, her name's Caroline, um, amazing Christian. My son um, probably went the other way a little bit, okay. but he's got, he's got an amazing foundation on the inside of him. He's got a lot of good stuff poured on the inside of him. Okay. And um, What was the, um, I want to know what the worst thing somebody said to you to try to comfort you, and what was the best thing? And again, uh, yeah. nothing malicious. No. They meant to be kind. Oh, and I, everyone tried to. Everyone, I think, does their very best to be to be helpful and of of some sort of usefulness. Um, the worst thing I heard was, um, I guess God needed a lawyer, so He took your daddy home. Mm. Said that to my kids, and I said, God needs a lawyer, really? Yeah, seriously. Yeah. And God, you know, to tell my children that God took their dad um, was just not quite what I wanted to hear. And what was the most comforting? The most comforting was from my very best friend at the time who said, Tammy, this event will not define your life. Okay. More to come. Yeah. And that was very helpful, you know. And that was at a time when I was consumed by, um, by the whole thing. Yeah. And six years later, I can I can say it, it, I don't think it does define me any longer. It's definitely a big part of who I am. Um, and I'd cut off my legs for ten more minutes with him yeah, to have him back. But um, I know that you know there's another Bible verse that says, uh, you know, I will not leave you orphans, and I, I I find great comfort in that. You know, for my children, for me, the hardest thing that I think for me is watching my children grieve and not being able to take that away. Um, that's the hardest thing. Sure. But um, now you know how God felt when yeah. Jesus was on the cross. Well, and how, and how amazingly um, faithful he is to all his promises um, that he's told us about, you know, I will never leave you or forsake you. And I've really felt those things. I've shared my story a lot with a lot of people, women's ministry, and, and there's not a time that ever that I've ever shared my story that someone hasn't come up and had to share part of their story with me. And to me, that's where um, that's where the grief part, that's where healing comes. Mm -hmm. When I'm not thinking about me and I'm thinking about how can I help somebody else, man, I get a lot better. And I, it's that way with recovery, too. Yeah, I yeah. it ties you? right in with recovery. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we... we, we we really feel the best when we're helping someone else. Right. Not and it's when we're absolutely being helped. impossible to feel a lot of pity for myself if I am looking for ways to help other people or being grateful about what, right. what the good things I have in my life. And I have a lot of good things in my life today. I have a lot of great things in my life. I have, um, I have a good job. I have great friends. I have a wonderful church family. I, it's, um, there's a lot of good stuff going on and, if I spent all of my time thinking about that my husband was dead, I'm sure that I wouldn't be able to see those things. But death will come to all of us at one point. You know? Right. If if you're married, one of you will probably die before the other. Um, if you have children, you may have to bury one of your children. If you have parents, you're you're probably going to have to bury your parents. And you know, not to embrace death in a in a in a like frightful or you know, oh well, you know, all we do is just die, but it's, it's going to be part of the journey, and it's just part of the journey. And for those of us who know Christ, it's, it's just a, it's a quick step into another world. So yeah. I know I'll see him again, and so that's great hope to me. Yeah. I always compare uh, uh, the life hereafter as when we were in the womb. 
We didn't know there was anything else out there, but we were warm, we were comforted, we felt loved, even though we didn't know what love meant. And then we were shoved into this horrible noise. And then at some point, God brings us back into his womb. And we just live a heavenly, wonderful, grace-filled life. Yeah. And we don't know anything else that's going on. No, and that's, that's okay. Yeah. That'll be all right. Thanks for coming by today. Thank you for having me. Thanks for letting me tell my story. You bet. You're welcome anytime. All right. Uh, well, we've got uh, Dennis here, who I've, I'm going to have to come up with a nickname. I, I thought of Sparky, but that just doesn't fit you. Army Brad's in the house. Uh, King David, great job today uh, producing. I'm Jay Michael McCoy. If I haven't told you lately, thanks for listening. Love this job. Couldn't do it without you. Right here on webcastonelive.com and Restoring Hope. Remember, one thing I ask you to do between now and the time we get together again, just one. Please pray.